Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to Africa Faith and Justice Network. Today we are going to discuss uh, the World Bank's policy called doing business. The gap between rich and poor countries continues to widen because of many factors. One of these factors is called doing business, a policy of the World Bank. Since 2014, uh, more than 200 organizations, scholars, and individuals have dedicated time and resources to end this policy of the World Bank. Finally, Victory Day came. The World Bank announced on September 16 that it was discontinuing the publication of doing business report. So, with me to discuss what it means to defeat the World Bank is Mr. Frederick Musa, Policy Director at the Oakland Institute based in California, USA. Uh, Mr. Musa, good morning. Good morning, Bati. Nice to be with you again. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So please, can you briefly tell us what doing business is as a policy of the World Bank? Yes, sure. So the Doing Business is a project of the World Bank that was started in 2002. It's, uh, it's important to start with that because it's, it was initiated uh, just at the end of uh, the official end of the structural adjustment programs. And so it was really meant to replace the structural adjustment program. And the, the idea of the World Bank was to put in place a ranking. So all countries would be ranked, all countries in the world would be ranked according to the reforms, uh, policy changes, deregulation they do in order to be more attractive, more favorable to business. It, is, it was uh, a very insidious uh, instrument because it's, given it's a ranking, it forces countries to compete against each other. If you are Mali, you, you will cut your uh, corporate tax, so you are more attractive. But if Burkina Faso does uh, um, corporate uh, reduction of corporate tax plus deregulation of, uh, I don't know, requirement for investors, then Burkina Faso will get a better score than Mali. And then Mali will be forced to do uh, some, to take some other measures so they can compete. So all countries were forced to compete against each other in a race to the bottom towards deregulation, towards being more attractive uh, for uh, international investors, I mean, international and domestic investors. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, with, when you say it's a policy, it's not really a policy. At the end of the day, it became the, the goal for many, many governments, especially in the global south, especially in Africa, the goal was to get a better ranking, whatever it takes, whatever it costs. Better ranking by regulating, by cutting taxes for the rich in order to attract these investments. In the meantime, they are taking food off the table of the people they are uh, governing. And so um, when the World Bank um, enacted this, this kind of program, who did it intend really to benefit? It's, uh, the World Bank has always this, uh, this very nice narrative that uh, it's uh, about benefiting the people and fighting poverty. But what is behind that is, I mean, they have never brought any evidence that uh, doing what they were prescribing to countries will really benefit. The idea is if we attract more investors, we'll have more economic growth. And by having more economic growth, at some point, uh, it will trigger on the world population and uh, the, the economies will benefit and people will benefit. But really, it's, um, it's really a very, uh, very narrow neoliberal thinking that, uh, that just suggests that economic growth will equal uh, uh, human development, and we know we have 
decades of experience and knowledge that it is not true. So yeah, the, what we are told is it's supposed to benefit the people, but we know, and Africans know that for decades and decades of exploitation and uh, so-called foreign investment, uh, it doesn't necessarily bring you human development at the end of the day. So the intended uh, uh, results weren't met. Uh, as we can see, they discontinued the, the, the program. So can, can you give us some examples of, of the harm done? Because if they decided to discontinue and these countries have been competing against one another, slashing taxes um, and, and, and disregarding uh, many, uh, many uh, safeguard measures uh, that protected people, can you explain to us some of the harm done? Yeah, that's very easy. We started actually looking into, uh, into the doing business because of the work we are doing around um, international so-called investments in, uh, in Africa around agriculture and natural resources. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and all the land grabbing we've seen over the past uh, decade at least. And, um, and clearly we've seen a number of countries, if you take Sierra Leone or Liberia, we have countries that got good scores for reducing the, 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 the restrictions around uh, the, the ability for investors to come and lease land or to come and register as new company and acquire, uh, acquire land and, and natural resources. So any country who will do that will get a good score from the, from, from the World Bank. So the arm is, is very obvious when we know the scale of land grabbing on the continent and how so many companies have come over the years to take over land from the people, displacing them, having, uh, having them faced with all kinds of abuses and loss of livelihoods, loss, loss of uh, the, the, the natural resources and access to water, access to, to basic farmland, forests, and so on. So, this is uh, the link we made and we've documented, we've document, we've produced dozens of reports, including a number of them documenting really these impacts at country level. And we can redraw really this, uh, this connection between this deregulation and how this deregulation uh, enables investors to come in and to, be, to, do, to do very profitable deals for themselves and export resources at the end of the day. So you have the, the impact, direct impact on the livelihood of the local communities who are affected, but you have also a broader impact of, uh, on uh, uh, the world population when, when governments believe that, or, or tend to believe that by attracting all these investors is gonna, is gonna benefit the, the, their people and their economy while the, the, the companies would come, take over land and resources, but also export their benefits and won't be taxed and won't be uh, really contributing to the local economy. So the, the, the loss is, is tremendous for all the, the countries who have really accepted the logics uh, of, the, of the bank to, uh, to deregulate and focus on attracting investors at all costs. Indeed, uh, the, uh, the reduction in uh, these restrictions, uh, allowing them to acquire more land, and as you said, access to forests, water, and so on. Uh, we have uh, many examples. Um, actually, you, your organization, Ocon Institute, did um, release a documentary, Heraco Debaco. Um, isn't that one of the examples of uh, this kind of policies? I, re I remember this, this company, an American company was uh, um, able to acquire a lease in Cameroon paying $1 per hectare per year for 99 years renewable ones. Can you really wrap around, uh, you know, give us an idea? what such an investment means to the local people in the light of what you, you documented in Heracol Dibaco. Yeah, I mean, actually it's, uh, it's, it's always problematic to call that an investment when companies come to really profit and exploit and, and plunder uh, 
countries and communities. The, they call themselves investors. Sometimes they even call themselves developers. And, uh, and people buy sometimes this language, which is, which is uh, really fallacious when you think of it. Uh, it's uh, in the Heracles uh, project example is a good one. We have a, a company from Wall Street going into Cameroon to to do uh, palm oil plantations at very advantageous conditions, as you underlined, and um, uh, pretending to, to to come there to do development. And they they even created the NGOs and foundations around that. And um, uh, went there to acquire over 70,000 hectares of land at very ridiculous cost for them. And uh, local communities never accepted to give away their land. Uh, they, were, uh, they were suddenly, they saw the bulldozers coming and then taking away their forest and their farmland. And they all stood up against this, uh, against this project. So, as often in, a, in, a, in the projects we have looked at, the companies find individuals who are going to take some advantage out of the deals and who will be, uh, who will, who will be the face of the community acceptance or welcome to these companies. But what we see overall is that local communities tend to lose all their resources and livelihoods. They rarely go through uh, or must never go through a real consultation and acceptance process. They find ways to, uh, to make many promises to the communities and have them signing off their, or have some individuals signing off their land. And at the end of the day, uh, there's really no development for the people, but hundreds of millions of dollars coming, uh, coming out of, the, of these plantations, which especially those working in, in palm oil plantations, which, uh, which are very profitable for these companies. And this is, uh, I'm glad you, you raised this because it is really uh, what investment looks like in many countries today on the continent. When, when governments say, oh, we're going to attract investors, investors are coming to do this kind of thing. And they are not coming to, to see where they can address gaps or where they can benefit local communities or the local people. They, they come and this is a, the way I mean, this is a purpose uh, in life is to do business. They come to do business and to uh, and to export profits. So that's that's really problematic. And this brings us to, to 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 this broader dimension of the the problem with this doing business project is by having government focusing on attracting investors. They, they don't focus on thinking of what would be the best policy instruments, actions we can do for our country, where, what are our advantages, what are the, 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 the opportunities we have, what are the skills in our communities or in our, the resources we have that can really benefit us. The, the only focus has become, oh, we need to attract investors. And whatever investors do at whatever cost, it is, it is um, it has become the priority, unfortunately, for many uh, policymakers and governments. And this is really the hope that by, with this end of the doing business, many policymakers on the continent will rethink really the way they've been listening to the World Bank as a big prescriber of policies on the continent and say, okay, now it's time to, 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 to look back and see really what what should be a better way, right way to do things? So practically, what we ended up uh, having is that these so-called investors, they will set business terms uh, because they are sought after by these countries. And then those countries that do resist, they are punished by the World Bank because they can access to loans and so on. And at the end of the day, is not the market for the poor; it's the market for um, the rich. So now, the harm has been done. Is it possible to reverse this harm? Of course, uh, of course, and um, and there's really a lot of hope that uh, African leadership can can stand up and uh, and uh, I mean it's it's. What, what has happened with, I mean, the, I think it's interesting to, to think, to, to look at 
what has happened, why is this was discontinued. It was discontinued because there was evidence of manipulation of, the, of this ranking. So not only it, it prescribes governments to do the wrong thing, but on the top of that, this ranking was fake. It was manipulated by World Bank officials to favor seven countries versus others, whatever the reforms they were doing. So it was really fallacious. And there are a number of uh, evidence, and it is now published since a few days ago, where, uh, where we have demonstration that the whole thing was a, a big manipulation. And this manipulation is really a slap in the face of the poorest countries and of all those who have believed that by attracting investors, they were doing the right thing and they, then they should really listen to the, to the bank. It's, really sh it, it, it's one of the best demonstrations of uh, our, the World Bank working on the behalf of the richest countries, powers, and corporations. It, it's just an instrument to, to, uh, to guide, for, to, to lead to more exploitation and more colonialism, unfortunately, of the, of, of, on the continent. So recognizing this, recognizing this, this manipulation, and, and also what I was uh, the day before this, uh, this wrong uh, thinking around development, there's so much opportunities to, to change the path and to, for government to say, okay, well, let's, let's get back to look at the, the policies we need, the investments we need, where do we need investment? We have, I mean, look at the Sahel region. We have so many uh, herders. We have one of the largest concentration of livestock in the world. The investment there should come to transformation of dairy, to uh, collect, uh, collect the milk, to uh, make yogurt. And what do you find in any village in, uh, in the Sahel region? You find the same Nestle powder milk, the needle lay uh, in, in some places, which comes from Europe. And, uh, and uh, the investments we see would be investment to take over this uh, base your land to do large scale agriculture instead of having investment that would come really to, to address the, the, the needs of the countries and the people. So the, the solutions are known. The governments can see uh, the, the, the fraud of the, these World Bank instruments and, uh, and just look very objectively at their own situation and, and take responsible decisions for the, for the future. Indeed. Uh, the the press release by the World Bank speaks uh, of irregularities in the research. So we are not uh, saying that um, we are attributing to them things that did not happen. They themselves acknowledge that there were irregularities. It, we do not know what kind of irregularities, but uh, it's an acknowledgement that this policy was just not a good one. So, um, I want to invite those who are listening to us to look up uh, the summary of what this oppressive policy is uh, and watch the video, Our Land, Our Business. It's a very short video, less than two minutes video on YouTube to really get the summary of what it is. And we want to really thank those who have stood up to the World Bank and as it served the poor people's lunch to the rich and the corporations, making them even richer. And what is next? We move forward to reverse the harm done, but they have to be able, we have to find a mechanism of making them pay because people have been displaced uh, and people's lives destroyed forever. Uh, land acquired has been used in a way that people would not have used it, using chemicals and so on. Uh, rivers have been polluted, and the list goes on. So, Mr. Musa, what is the other project you are working on at um, uh, Oakland Institute, which is worthy uh, um, noting at this point? Thank you. Well, there are many projects we are working on, and uh, we we keep documenting the impact of these kind of projects uh, around the world, but specifically in Africa. And, uh, and so there will be more more coming in our work. 
But I, I think it's important to, to mention that we are celebrating this victory today, but we remain vigilant because we know that, as I mentioned earlier, the World Bank started this doing business when they stopped officially the uh, structural adjustment programs. So we know they're going to find something else to take out of their heart to, to continue to do the same thing. So uh, this is good news, but we need to remain vigilant and active and, uh, and, and continue what we've been doing and, uh, and monitor what these institutions are doing. Also, I shall mention that in 2014, the World Bank, at the demand of the, the G8, was uh, started a project called the Enabling the Business of Agriculture, which was designed on the model of the doing business, but really more focused on agriculture. And this project is still going on so far. It hasn't been cancelled yet. We really hope it will be cancelled because it is based on a very flawed uh, model, uh, but we we will continue our campaign to uh, to abolish this other this other ranking, which is uh, which is really uh, even worse in in some ways because it goes into the details on how to privatize land, how to get rid of customary land rights, how to uh, to get rid of state land and put it for sale uh, for for private uh, for private investors. So this is a campaign that is still going on, and uh, with this, uh, with this success around the doing business, we're going to go back towards the, the World Bank, its key donors, the UK, the US, and the Gates Foundation, and go back to them saying, uh, "You have a project that is modeled after the doing business, which is continuing to 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 do harm on the continent. You need to stop this one as well." So this is going to be the next battle for us to go after the enabling the business of agriculture project, which is something we've been doing for, for the past few years, but we'll continue until this one ends too. Thank you so much. Indeed, uh, we must remain vigilant. They started structural adjustments, came up with doing business. Certainly, they have a lot of things they are ready to do to continue to undermine people's progress and continue to widen the gap between the rich and the poor. I would say that uh, we are ready to replace those policymakers at the World Bank with sound people like you. And then the people will be celebrating in a different way because we have the ideas it takes to bring this gap down and close it for, for good. Thank you, Musa, for your leadership. Those, you, people, those who do not know what, what Oakland Institute do, uh, does, they can look you up uh, online. Africa Faith and Justice Network has been a supporter of your work. And uh, thank you once again. We will see you very soon. Thank you so much. Lovely to be with you. Okay, bye-bye.